Moses, with dim legal light, needs to be told to put off his shoe from off his foot in the presence of the Lord of hosts. But John is manifestly far in advance of him because he lies lower and is like a dead man before the infinite majesty. How blessed a death is death in Christ. How divine a thing is life in him. If I might see Christ at this moment upon the terms of instant death, I would joyfully accept the offer. The bliss would far exceed the penalty. But as for the death of all within us, that is, of the flesh and of fallen nature, it is beyond measure desirable. And if for nothing else, my soul would pant more and more to see Jesus. May that two-edged sword which cometh out of his mouth smite all my besetting sins. May the brightness of his countenance scorch and burn up in me the very roots of evil. May he mount his white horse and ride through my soul, conquering and to conquer, casting out of me all that is of the old dragon and his inventions, and bringing every thought into subjection to himself. There would I lie at his dear conquering feet, slain by his mighty grace. Only one other reflection while we look at this fainting apostle. Observe well the place where he was overpowered. O oh, lovely thought, I fell as dead, but where? I fell at his feet as dead. It matters not what aileth us if we lie at Jesus' feet. Better be dead there than alive anywhere else. He is ever gentle and tender, never breaking the bruised reed or quenching the smoking flax. In proportion as he perceives that our weakness is manifest to us, in that degree will he display his tenderness. He carrieth the lambs in his bosom. He doth gently lead those that are with young. Feebleness wins on him. When he sees a dear disciple prostrate at his feet, he is ready at once to touch him with the hand of his familiar love and to revive him by his own strength. He restoreth my soul. He giveth power unto the faint. He saith unto our pitiful weakness, Fear not, I am the first and the last. To be as dead were not desirable, but to be as dead at Jesus' feet is safe and profitable. Well doth our poet say, when expressing his desire to escape from all worthy bonds. But oh, for this no strength have I. My strength is at his feet to lie. And now having seen the disciple overpowered, I shall ask her consideration of that same disciple restored. He was not long in the condition of death, for the master laid his right hand upon him and said to him, Fear not. Here then we shall notice that when the children of God become exceeding faint and feeble and their own sense of impurity and nothingness becomes painful and even killing to them, the Lord has ways of restoring and reviving their spirits. At first he does it by a condescending approach. He laid his hand upon me. It is noticeable that in the great cures which our Savior wrought, he almost always touched the patient. He could with a word have healed, but to prove his fellowship with the sick, he put his hand upon the leper and upon the blind eye and touched the deaf ear, thus manifesting his condescending contact with the infirmities of our nature. The master could have spoken a word to John and have revived him, but he did not stand at a distance or guard himself with a touch me not, but instead of that he commenced his cure with a touch. No other hand could have revived the apostle, but the hand which was pierced for him had matchless power. There is mighty healing in the royal hand of our Emmanuel. When the Holy Spirit inspires us with a sense of the relationship which Christ bears to us, of the sympathy which Christ feels with us, of the kinship and fellow feeling which reign in Jesus' breast, then are we comforted 
To know that he is not ashamed to call us brethren is a wellspring of comfort to a tried child of God. To feel his presence, to perceive the touch of his hand, and to hear him say, I am with thee, be not dismayed, for I am thy God. This is new life to our waning spirits. Oh, what bliss is this! In all their afflictions, he was afflicted. He is a brother born for adversity, a sympathetic and tender friend touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He laid his hand upon me. O child of God, pray for a manifestation of the kinsman Christ to thy soul. Ask that he would instruct thee as to the fact that he enters into thy grief, having himself endured the like. Thou art one with him, and he is one with thee. And as surely as the head feels the pain of the members, so does Jesus share in all the sorrows of his people. Let this be a comfort to thee. Thou who art now lying as dead before the risen Lord. He comes near to thee, not to kill thee, but to revive thee. By most intimate intercourse, talking with thee, as a man speaketh with his friend, O man greatly beloved, be not so overwhelmed with the greatness of thy Lord as to forget his love, his great love, his familiar love, which at this moment lays its hands upon thee. The same action implies the communication of divine strength. He laid his right hand upon me. It is the hand of favor. It is also the hand of power. God gives strength to those who have none. He puts power into the faint. When the child of God is brought very low, it is not a mere subject for consideration or theme for reflection that can lift him up. Sick men want more than instruction. They require cordials and supports. There must be actual strength and energy imparted to a swooning soul. And glory be to God by his own Holy Spirit, Jesus can and does communicate energy to his people in the time of weakness. He has come that we may have life and that we may have it more abundantly. The omnipotence of God is made to rest upon us so that we even glory in infirmities. My grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. It's a blessed promise which has been fulfilled to the letter to many of us. Our own strength has departed and then the power of God has flowed in to fill up the vacuum. I cannot explain the process. These are secrets and mysteries to be experienced rather than expounded. But as the coming of the Spirit of God into us first of all makes us live in regeneration, so the renewed coming of the power of God into our soul raises us up from our weakness and our faintness into fresh energy. Be thou encouraged then, thou fainting spirit today. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. All power belongeth unto the Lord, and he will give it plenteously to those who have none of their own. Be of good courage, and wait upon him, for none shall be ashamed who make him their confidence. Then there followed a word from the master's own mouth. He spake and said, Fear not. Here he applied the remedy to the disease. Christ himself is our medicine as well as our physician. His voice, which stilled the sea, also cast out all our fear. The word of God as we find it in this book is very consoling. The word of God as we hear it from Christ's ministers has great power in it. But the real and true power of the word lies in Jesus the word. When the truth falls fresh from his own lips, then is it power. Right truly did the master say, the words which I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. With what power did those syllables fall on the fluttered heart of John? Fear not. 
Oh, that we might hear the same voice by the Spirit in our inmost 